Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Ibn Abayt Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. A very warm welcome back to Torah. We're in Parshas the Yakel. Now, before we start, everyone is aware of a war brewing in the Ukraine, in Russia. And I just want to tell everybody, this is my own thoughts, metaphysically, whatever is happening in the world is happening for the sake of Israel. Obviously, we don't know what's really going to happen, but ultimately in the end, everything's going to be good. So we should have a moon in faith. Of course, you have to do what you have to do to stay alive. Um, but know that the heart of the king is in the hand of Hashem. Whether you think of Putin as, as a king or not is irrelevant. He still has a lot of, he wields a lot of power, and so does Zelenko. And there are laws, there are Jewish laws of how to create a war, and always diplomacy is the best policy, is the first policy. And there are reasons to go to war, even for resources, if you truly need them, which I doubt that's the case here. And again, the name Russia, right? That's what we call <laughs> this evil empire. And it's not a accident that the name Russia, just look it up. I won't even tell you what it means in Hebrew. Just look it up. The word Russia, everyone knows what that is, right? It's evil, pure evil. Anyway, so we should pray for the peace of the world. And it all begins here. Peace in Yerushalayim, and what I'm going to tell you tonight, it parshas v'yakel. The whole reason to gather everyone together was for the sake of peace. So there's no better parsha to discuss than with the parsha we're discussing tonight. We're in, par in chapter 35 of Exodus, and just to like a few pieces of information. Again, I always like to start by letting people know learning Hebrew is not a bad thing. <laughs> it's actually a very good thing. How else are you going to feel the Torah? To let it go into your guts, go into your brain, into your soul, than to hear the Hebrew itself, number one. And in the description box below, we have a link where you can get to the, the uh, source sheets, <coughs> the Hebrew source sheets you can follow. You won't get a colorful... Uh, Co copy like I have. Wow, it's so beautiful, right? All those different colors. But uh, if you are interested in following with the English source sheets, you can always email me and um, I could, uh, you know, send, me, send them to you by email on our list. So I just want to mention about this concept called the chronological order of the Torah. So we have what we call an oral Torah. For those who aren't familiar with that, I'm not going to go into that now, but you understand what that means, that we were at Sinai and we received the Torah and we we the Jewish people are the teachers We're going to tell you what it says and what it means and therefore this concept called chronological order is a dispute It's it's a really a minor dispute. It's not a major dispute between Ramban and Rashi Basically everybody agrees there is no chronological order to the Torah. However, what does that mean? In Hebrew, it says, Ein mugdam umuchar b'torah. Literally, there's no earlier or later in the Torah. There's no order, meaning chronologically, time-wise. However, the Ramban does say that it is in chronological order, except where it's obvious from dates or very specific circumstances where you can see that it's not in order. Rashi says, no, it's totally based on the oral Torah. You cannot guess when things happened. It's, it's outlined in the oral Torah itself. And just as an example, if you go to Numbers um, chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see it's already talking about the second year, true, but in the, in the, um, in the, in the uh, second month. And if you go onward to chapter 9, it's chapter 9, verse 1 of, of Numbers, it specifically says that it's in the first month of the second year, which doesn't really make any sense because he's talking about chapter 1 verse, verses 9, you would expect chapter 1 to come before chapter 9, but that ain't the case, okay? So keep in mind. Now what we're going to deal with is this concept of Moses gathered the entire assembly of the children of Israel together, and in Hebrew, 
Moshe et kol adat b'nei Israel. Moses gathered, he assembled the entire assembly, the entire uh, group of the Jewish people. And the verse continues, the Yomer Aleihem, and Moses is supposed to say to them, Ela Devarim Asher Tziva Hashem Lasos Osam. Right? These are the things which Hashem commanded for them to do. Okay, so Rashi right away tells us this day that Moses gathered everyone together was none other than the day after Yom Kippur, the first year, the very first Yom Kippur, and he gathered them together. Why? We're going to have to discuss. But just to go back to Parsha's, Parsha Jethro, because that's going to play an important role in what we're discussing here. If you go to the English sheets, number four, it's Exodus chapter 18. Okay, so you're talking about quite a few chapters before. Uh, chapter 18, verse 13, it says, It came about on the next day, Vayhimimacharat. And it was on the following day that Moses sat, the Yoshev Moshe, the Yeshev Moshe, Lishpot Esa'am. He sat down to judge the people. Let's just continue with the verse because it's going to play an important part. The Amod Ha'am Al Moshe, and the people stood by Moshe. Now, interestingly, it says, Min Haboiker Ad Erev, from the morning until the evening. Now, we're talking about Moses actually sat judging the people from the morning until the evening. And the people are standing around waiting to be judged during that time. But what does Rashi say there? When did Moses sit to judge the people? It says in the Hebrew, Vihimacharat. It was from the following day. Rashi says this was the day after Yom Kippur. So chapter 18 is the day after Yom Kippur. Chapter 35 is the day after Yom Kippur. Why is that so significant? And why is it also significant that he sat from the morning until the evening? And this is one of the seemingly, allegedly, <laughs> complaints, or maybe constructive criticism that Jethro had. Perhaps it was because the people were standing around, not necessarily because Moses was doing the judging, but we'll see. Let's investigate. Let's go back to the clear car. And right away, the clear car says, Perish Rashi, on our verse 1 of chapter 35, regarding this gathering of the congregation of Israel, Lemacharat Yom Kippurim. We already saw that. And then he brings down in Parshas Yisro, which is chapter 18, verse 13 of, of Exodus, Vehi mi macharat veyeshev Moshe lishpot esa'am. We saw that also. And he says, Perish Rashi Sham. Rashi says there, Ki zehayam lemacharat Yom Kippurim. So, it's very strange. I mean, I already gave you this background that the Torah is not in order. It's fine. Okay. But why was it so important then that Moses was doing the judging and it was all happening then? Keep in mind, our Parsha begins with three verses that are talking about Shabbos. And then right away from uh, verse 4, it's talking about the gathering or let's say uh, what you need to give as a gift. Um, to the Beis HaMikdash for the ingredients, the materials to build the Beit HaMikdash. So that starts on verse 4, and it goes through uh, the ingredients, the, the, the materials, sorry. Okay? So, that's all for the sake of building the Mishkan. So right away, we're on the third line down in the Kliakar. Remember, we're using the Kliakar for the, the purpose of the outline for the discussion. He has, I would say, it's a chidush, okay? But he says, Nira lefarish. It seems that this is the explanation, what I'm about to tell you. Shiyadua, that it's well known. Shahakel zeh, that this particular gathering. Hoya lehodia lehem mitzvah samishkan vahanadava. Before we go on, I just want to mention, if you go back to that Rashi of our verse, um, is it our verse? One second. Yeah. The latter part, it's number two on the source sheet, English source sheet. So not only was it the day after Yom Kippur, but it's hithil, mean, meaning it's, it's causative. Okay? And therefore he caused them to assemble. But Rashi specifically says he didn't assemble them by force. 
He didn't assemble them by using his hands, which I think it means an, it's an expression of force, but rather they assemble through his speech. Like, what does that mean? Wait till you hear what we're about to say and why that's so important that Rashi said that. Anyway, so let's go on. Vohaya Moshe Chayshesh pen yitnadev echad mehem lemishkan davar she'enu shalom. Why was it so important for Moses to gather everyone together to inform them of the Mishkan now? He was concerned. He was concerned. Choshesh. Lest somebody donate, give free-heartedly something, some kind of material for the, for the Mishkan, something that didn't belong to that person. What would be the problem with that? We're talking about building this great and awesome edifice called the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and eventually, right, similar to what we have as a temple, a mikdash, the concept, from anything that's stolen, this is where we would find our kapara, our atonement. Can imagine this great and holy place being built with stolen material? Very important not to have that. V'zelo yitachin, I'm sorry, I skipped one, one point. V'choyshev kihu toiso bedin. Imagine whether it was on the night of the 10th plague when the Jews went to different um, houses of the Egyptians and they were in the middle of taking something which they had the right to uh, borrow and take that another Jew was in the same house and they both reached for it at the same time and each one thought he grabbed it first meanwhile he didn't it already was in the hand of another Jew that's called thievery but he didn't know it might not have th thieved the kavana with intent or by the sea when the Egyptians drowned and the loot, the booty, came up on the shore. Can you imagine two Jews bending down to pick up an item and each one thinks he picked it up first. Similar to the Mishnah in, um, in Bab Metzia, right? Where two are grabbing a talus and each one thinks it belongs to him. And we cause them, okay, cause them to make an oath and whatnot. And we want to get to the bottom of it. Who does it really belong to? So he says, It's not, um, it, it's not logical. It doesn't follow through that um, we would build this house for Hashem from anything that would be stolen, this holy uh, edifice. Now, he brings down a verse in Kohelis, that's Ecclesiastes. Now, the pshat over there does not exactly match what the Kliyakar, I believe, is trying to say. The verse over there, it's chapter 3, verse, I think it's verse 16, okay? It's, I'll just read, I think, verse 16 and 17, you can read. Moreover, this is King Solomon. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of justice, there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every deed there. It seems from the Mephorshim, from the commentaries, that what King Solomon is talking about is that within the justice system, there's a tremendous amount of corruption. That's what it seems the pshat, the explanation is. But I think what the Kliakar is saying that, look, when two people come before us, one of them probably is guilty. Of course, we have to look at both of them as guilty, and when they both accept the judgment, we look at them both as innocent. But nevertheless, I think that's what the Kliakar is saying, that there's always going to be issues with the possibility of wickedness amongst the litigants themselves. The, the, verse, the part of the verse he brings down is, Makom ha-mishpat shama ha-resha. Anyway, he goes on, Al-Kain hichriz Moshe Tachila. This is exactly why Moses first announces. We're talking about the day after Yom Kippur. He comes down from the mountain, and the first thing he says is, Mi baldavarim. Who owns something that is going to donate for the, for the base of Mikdash, for the, for the tabernacle, that's under dispute? Yigash alai mishpat. Approach me, Moshe, for judgment. Ba'ifin shekola'am al-mekomo yavabashalom. In a way, in a fashion, that the entire people will be able to be in a, a, a state of mind, a situation, in their place, so to speak, will come to peace. Because that's going to be the ultimate goal, right? That's why we're praying for the peace for the world. We really want it. And therefore he informed every individual. 
Mashu shalo o she'enu shalo. Whatever you own, you want to donate something, you have to know that it belongs to you. If there's any, let's say, hashash, any suspicion, any worry, any thought, you know, that maybe it doesn't belong to you, someone made a complaint, let's get it clear now. Come to me for judgment in a way that what? If you're not sure, let's clarify it through judgment. Va'az Choya Modiam Inyan Hanadava Lamor. And it was only then, from that point onwards, right? He first gathered everyone together, then he explained all the all the ingredients that were necessary and how you should give. And then look at verse 5, right? Chapter 34, 35, verse 5. You'll find this in number 6. It says, Kechu Me'itachem Trumal Hashem. Right? Take from yourselves an offering for the Lord. Right? Every generous hearted person shall bring it. Right? And then he goes through the different um, materials. But what's the word me itachem? From you. From what belongs to you. Let's take that word out for a second. Couldn't it have made sense just to say They should take these gifts or the, right, the, the gifts and bring it to Hashem. Why does that word appear? Me itachem. So the clear car is explaining that that shows you it means that it has to belong to you. That's what the word itself means, and it was not extra. If it was extra, then you're right. I mean, it's it is it's not extra. Let's just go on. He says, mm-hmm. It has to belong to you. Mm-hmm. It cannot belong to someone else. Now, de'im lokein, if that's not true what I'm saying, then that word mi'itachem is mi'utar. Then it would be totally extra. And we all know there's not even a single extra letter, let alone a word, in the Torah. Everything is there to teach us something. The shabli safeik lo haya yocho lishpo des biyom echad. Now, we're going to actually just take a deep breath, and we're going to talk about this... So again, he changes gears a little bit and he says, even though there's no doubt that he was able, there's no doubt that he was not able, he's not capable, no human being is capable of judging all these people in one day, right? From morning until evening? Now, who, how many people were so talking about 600,000? Okay, so not, maybe not everyone had a dispute. But we're still talking about a lot of people. So number one, quantity-wise, it doesn't seem likely there's almost no doubt here that he's not able to. And number two, And even in one particular day, how can one person sit for 12 whole hours? They Listen, you have to go to the bathroom, you have to pray, you have to learn Torah. There's a lot of things to do, right? To judge, and yet what did he also do? He also explained to them and taught them what they have to bring in terms of materials from the Mishkan on that day. So there's no way that he sat for 12 hours. But that seems to be what Jethro was complaining about. You're sitting there from morning till evening. So, and that's why we have this verse. He brings down the verse in uh, Exodus uh, 18, 13. Min haboker ad erev. Even though it says that he sat there from the morning until the evening, that's not what it means. Whoa! What do you mean it's not what it means? Hainuk perish Rashi. That what does Rashi say over there? Shekol hadan din emet laamito. I want you to go back to number four, where it says, "You know what I did? I actually split it up. Go to number seven. Number seven, I, I put it separately. It says from morning until evening, right? Is it even possible to say this that Moses actually sat in judgment from morning until evening? No." But rather, what is this coming to teach us? That any judge who issues a true verdict as truth demands it. Okay, no, before that's what it means here when he says, "Shakol hadan din emes lamito." Any judge who sets out to try to arrive at the ultimate truth in judgment, mala olava katuv. That's what Rashi continues to say that Scripture deems it. As if he engaged in Torah the whole day, kilu nasa shut of kadosh baruch hu b'masay breishis. That what it was as if he was a partner with the Holy One, blessed be He, in the act of creation. 
That's amazing. So in other words, it's not telling us that Moses really sat there from morning until evening, although maybe, maybe he did, but this is what the clear card is explaining. No, that when you do this as a judge, you're becoming a partner with Hashem in the whole, not just the creation, but the maintaining of the entire universe. <clears throat> um, and there's a verse we're about to see in Genesis, it's not the only time it's said, but in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 5, where it says at the end of day 1, Vihi era, vihi voker, and it was evening and it was morning. Now, I have a very simple question I think everyone should ask is, well, over there when Moses is judging, it says from morning until evening. But in Genesis, or, you know, not just day one, but you know, through the whole series of the, the days, it's fr there, there was evening and there was morning. So I recall seeing a clear car that discusses the idea that God judges at night and he wants us to set up our systems of justice here during the day. We don't judge at night, we judge during the day. And if, God forbid, we don't do what's supposed to be done, remember, we're partners with Hashem in maintaining justice. For the B'nai Noach out there listening, try to listen, right? That our job, human beings, is to make sure that there's justice in this world. And the Jewish people have a specific responsibility to set up these courts, just like the non-Jews also have a, one of the seven commandments, to set up systems of justice. That if we don't do our part, Hashem will do the judgment, which is not, that's really not acting as his partner but in a disassociated way. And it, the outcome is not necessarily good. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, the clear card mentions that somewhere else. So now we're on page two of the Hebrew source sheets. And he says, everything I said has to be true. Deem lo because if it's not, we already know that he gathered them together to tell him about the construction of the Mishkan. So he, there's no way that he judged from morning until evening. It had to be some time was left over to teach them Torah about the um, construction of the Mishkan, which we see that there's five chapters, right? There's five parshiot, right? There's so many words in the Torah that describe the construction of the Mishkan. And, and you know what? They started donating. They started donating right away, and it's just in a few days they had everything they needed. So we know it was that day that he discussed it. So there's no way that he discussed that he he judged them from morning till evening. <speaking in Hebrew> Nevertheless, keep in mind, even the gifts were not completely uh, you know received and given on one day. It took a few days. <speaking in Hebrew> Perhaps this is what he was explaining to them. Shekol davar shishnayim chalukim alav that any object, anything that you guys own, where there is any kind of dispute over shelo yitnum nedava ad ki yitbarer techila hadin imi that don't give it, don't even think about it, don't give it until it's been clarified first who is the owner. Now the Kliyakar continues al tzad haremez nomar from a deeper level, from a hinting idea shahakhel ze haya litavech hashalom be'nehem that this gathering actually served a great purpose. The purpose was to mitigate, to mediate peace between them. Amazing. And it happened on the day after Yom Kippur he ain't, and one second, and what's the first three verses about Shabbos? Because Shabbos also is about peace. The day after Yom Kippur will say carries a certain flavor. Mm, you can feel it. Anybody who experienced the true Yom Kippur, right, would know what it means to have this camaraderie that still lingers in the air. You can taste it, right, because you had. Listen, we should really be thinking about this all year round. But at least 40 days before Yom Kippur, we're in the beginning of Elul, and we're already in a certain mode of trying to find things to do tshuva for, of things to forgive other people for, to, for things that we should be asking forgiveness for. So keep in mind, this is like the pinnacle. This is like the sea, the, right? The, the climax of, of 40 days of efforts to bring peace to the world and bring peace between man and man, 
between man and God. So that's Yom Kippur itself. So this, this gathering, this assembly was the day after. Ki ein adam dar im nachash achas. Now what we're going to about to describe is that what we do when we're all donating our own resources to this tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, we already discussed it as being such a holy place, a holy temple. This is where we find our atonement. It's all true. But think about this, that if we're all partners in an edifice that is going to house Hashem, the Shekhinah, we're partners. We're all partners in this edifice. And it's not just that we're partnering with Hashem, we're partnering with each other. And the word shutaf means a partner, a partnership, but it also means a roommate. Now, we're not saying that we're living in the house. God's living in the house. We're in and out, right, if we're lucky. But nevertheless, the word shutaf, so taking this Gemara in Yavamos, you'll find this on page 4, number 10. Now, this is discussing that point. At the bottom, the last line, it says, a person cannot reside in a basket, meaning like in an overturned, you know, like a, not an igloo, but let's say, you know, a bucket. You can't be in the same close quarters, in the same room, with a snake. Now, snake to me means something evil, right? And therefore, the sages do not allow, on a rabbinic level, a marriage to take place. That This whole Gemara was actually discussing it. So let's go back to the beginning of this sugya, this paragraph of the Gemara. It's talking about a deaf mute, a deaf mute male and a deaf mute woman, meaning that these are people that have seichel, they have intelligence, but they're just not able to communicate. And there are ways, let's say they don't communicate the normal way, but there are ways to still communicate. So, the, so rabbinically, there's nothing wrong from the Torah for them getting married. And the rabbis accept this and, and, and encourage such a marriage, no problem. That, that kind of marriage can be maintained because these are two thinking, intelligent people, and therefore the sages enacted the marriage for them. Now, I don't know how to translate the word imbecilical man. And so you have a man, let's just say, who's mentally challenged, and you have a woman who's mentally challenged. And it could be emotionally mentally. I mean, it could be really just, I don't know what words I can use, but you, you, get, you can use your imagination that there's no way these two people can live together under the same roof. There's no way shalom can be uh, mediated between them. And therefore, the rabbis don't allow such a marriage to take place. If one is seichel is there and the other one isn't, so that would be okay apparently. Um, but in this case, so this is the famous words that are used here: um, that ein adam dar im nachash achas. So basically, if you have, let's just say in our case, if there's Jews who are donating to the, this mishkan, and one is just irreconcilable, I mean, there's no way that there's any way of peace for this guy. So that's going to be a problem. So what did Moses want to do? He wanted to create a, and mediate peace, mithavech, peace between them, in a way that would be lasting. So let's continue. After Moses wanted to inform them of the concept of constructing the base of Mikdash, shiyu kulam shutafim bo where every one of these Jews would be a partner with each other. It would be as if, or the equivalent, using your imagination, just try to imagine, that it was as if they're all sitting in one dwelling place because they're all partners. Therefore, Moses saw that it was necessary to gather everyone together first, to become bound together, to become one group, to feel the unity of the people. Al came Perish Rashi. Now that's why Rashi actually tells us, well, Rashi's telling us because that's a fact according to Rashi. This is the actual day, but he goes out of his way to explain Shahizela Maharat Yom Kippurim. This was the day following Yom Kippur. 
לפי שכל חניות היו במחלוקת ותערומס, that up until this point, and unfortunately also after this point, many, if not all, of the different encampments of the Jewish people were filled with um, arguments and complaints, maklokas, chutz min chania shekodem matan Torah, except for one, that one encampment, when we arrived at Mount Sinai, you can find this in chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 2, where, by the way, many other places, v'yichanu, v'yichanu, v'yasu, right? They, they traveled, they encamped, right? You have they encamped, plural, they encamped, but here, right before Matan Torah, it says, v'yichan sham Yisrael, that Israel singular, they, I should say they, but let's say it, him, her, it, Israel encamped, singular, Israel encamped. Im Cain, if that's true, Ech Efshar Lahakilam Bizman Shame Mikulakim Vain Datam Shava. If that's true, how would it ever be how would it ever be possible to gather them, to assemble them at a time where they were disparate, where they were in argumentative state of mind, where they didn't have <coughs> a peace among them? Their Ain Datam Shava, where they were not all in the same frame of mind. What other time would it have been best fit for Moses to have gathered them together except for the day after Yom Kippur? I mean, I should say, meaning the time they ended up at Mount Sinai, this time, 120 days later, actually it's more than that, right? No, it's exact, plus a few days, right? 124, 25 days, 123 days, whatever it is, Right? So you're talking about they're still at the same place that they joined for the, for the revelation. So he says, This is why it's the same encampment. The day after Yom Kippur is the same encampment when they arrive for the revelation. And the day itself created, well, let's say Metavech is a mediated. Uh, intervene, so to speak, peace among them. And therefore, not just Yom Kippur, but the day after. Right? So in other words, Yom Kippur created that, and that feeling lingered even that day, and we'll explain why or how. Because Yom Kippur creates such an atmosphere and it lingers, it's certainly easier to gather everyone on the following day. The whole time that the peace of the previous day still existed amongst them. Now, at this point, he's now going to change gears a little bit, so you understand. But if a couple days have passed, when he says a day or two, they, they stood like this without gathering together. As lo you come a shalom, there's no way to establish, they couldn't stand up on this peace that existed. And in fact, what would happen? Ki kavar nitparadu hachavila, the kol ish ledark opone. As the days progress, the, the package of peace unravels. Just imagine what was built on this day of Yom Kippur, that such a package would become unraveled as the days progress and each person goes along his merry way, to, so to speak. Each person goes in his own direction, thinking about himself. And in order not to, let's say, go against this, towards this peace of what would happen, what goes against the peace, words of, of, of fighting, or even money matters. I mean, I've seen people who are like totally normal. And all of a sudden, like money comes up, you don't even recognize them anymore. Right? It can really take a person out of this world. Ki'ain l'shalom 
El Yom Kippurim Esek Bezeh. Remember, on Yom Kippur, none of this matters. We're not dealing with those ideas because there's true peace. Al Kain Yosha Moshe Gam Lishpot Betzam Ayomahu. Therefore, Moses sat to judge the people on this day, which is called the following day. In order that the peace that still stood still remained with them. And they were actually fitting to be like as if they were living in one roof, in one place. Nobody's a snake. That every one of them was dwelling as if in a Mishkan, because they were partners in the Mishkan, as if they were, right, as, as they were all partners in the Mishkan itself. Now, after the fact that they were all truly unified, through this command to make the Mishkan, and they're already donating, they're willing to donate, they're, they're partners in theory. Now, we do find there were several times throughout Tanakh, throughout the Torah, I should say, that Moses did gather them together. Even though those kihilot, those um, um, gatherings, were not any time, even in the future, the day after Yom Kippur. They were throughout the 40 years, the remaining 39 years. The Kol Shekein Lama Shekatu, Lama Shekatav Akeda, Derek Melitz Ala Pasuk, the, the clear card wants to share, uh, share with us something that the, the Balakeda, the, the author of the Akeda, writes in a advocacy fashion, right? A defensive fashion. He wants to present this idea that if you read, right? We said the first three verses are dealing with Shabbos. What is the, verse 3? Verse 3 is, look number 12. You shall not kindle fire in any of your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. And then it goes into the Mishkan. So you have these first three verses of chapter 35 dealing with Shabbos. We know that there's 39 creative acts that are forbidden to do. These 39 creative acts all are what went into building the Mishkan. And whatever we're doing to build the Mishkan, to create the Mishkan, we're not allowed to do on Shabbos. Okay, we talked about that last week a little bit. So, um, basically... Why is this one out of 39 pointed out? Many people talk about it. The clear car explains, Shalo yatsitu eish machloket beyom hashabbos. Even though, let's just translate, you shall not kindle fire, right, on Shabbos day. You shouldn't kindle the fire. Now, we all know that the Jews, right, we light candles before Shabbos. We enjoy hot food on Shabbos. We enjoy Shalom Bayis by having those candles that we can enjoy on Friday night. Right? There's all kinds of things that we use fire for before Shabbos that we're allowed to. And you know the Sadducees and maybe the uh, Karaites. I don't know. There's a lot of different cults. I, mean, I don't know what the Christians do. I don't think they even have, have Shabbos. But there are different cults amongst the Christians. And they will go out of their way, the Karaites, the Sadducees, not, they would not light candles. They would specifically blow them out right before Shabbos. They would sit in a cold house, no fireplace, and they would not eat hot food. They would suffer, right? Very different, very different uh, outlook on life. And this is our Shabbos. So the clear car is telling you that, yes, it's true, you're not allowed to light, ignite the fire, but it means also and perhaps this might even be a bigger point, that one should not create argumentations, should not, should not go out machlokas, disputes on Shabbos. And why specifically Shabbos is so fitting to make fights? Is it? Shanir pim hema milacha. Because during Shabbos, nobody's going to work. And what happens when you're sitting around with your spouse or your kids or who knows what your neighbors you're sitting around doing nothing it's so easy to fall into let lush and horror this and that and get in arguments so that's what he's saying he says make sure on shabbos when people are not busy right yesh lachush there is to be more concerns lachush biyoter az le'esh hamachlokes mit lakachat betoch devari betalin 
it's so easy to fall into and there's a worry, there's a concern much more on Shabbos than any other day of the week that you would ignite the fire of argumentation because of your I'm going to use the word bored he doesn't use the word bored, he says because you're doing nothing <laughs> okay See, im kain yofa amar now we understand greatly when Rashi said, remember the word of the Yakel? The Yakel, he says, he gathered them with words. He didn't use his hands, meaning he didn't use force. Shehikhilam liyot baguda achas tzivoy lo sa'avaru. That he actually gathered them together with his own voice through the command. The command of what? Don't start up with your fellow Jew. Don't ignite a fire on Shabbos. No argumentation. Let it go. Learn how to let it go. And that's what it means. He just quotes Rashi, Sha'ayyade Diburo Heimna Asafim. That it was through his words that he gathered together because he wanted them to come, you know, like let's say, you know, with a free, what's the word, a free spirit. They wanted to follow Moses' directive and become a Gura Achas. So what do we learn from this? I hope we can bring this home. Right? This lesson is so important. To the, the truth is Shabbos is for learning Torah. It's true. It's for spending time with your family. But if you don't have the Torah in that relationship with you and your wife, you're bound to get into fights. You're bound to. Right? So hopefully the Torah itself will help you work on your character, help you understand the beauty of Shabbos. Right? The Torah is just, it's wider than the sea. It's longer than, than the earth. And it's incredible, and it can create peace in the world, right? So through incorporating it into your life. So I wish everyone a real, true Shabbat Shalom. That's why we say Shabbat Shalom, right? You say good Shabbos, I get that. But to have Mama Shalom on, on Shabbos, so I wish everyone not just a Shabbat Shalom, but a great Shalom Dick life, right? And... Um, in two weeks' time, we're not going to have a shear because I have a wedding. I just want to mention this Shabbos, Baruch Hashem, three of the girls that we dealt with uh, through conversion are all getting married in the next couple weeks. So we're having a big kiddush if anybody wants to come, if anybody's in Jerusalem and wants to come shear Chadash on Emek Rafayim 45 uh, around, I don't know, quarter to 11. So we're having a big kiddush for, let's just remember their names, Simcha and Moshe. And... Shoshana and Chanuch and Rivka and Asaf. Okay, so there's Rat Hashem, those three couples should have a lot of Shalom bias. Okay, so uh, we'll see you all next week. Bizrat Hashem.